Welcome to this lecture series in group theory. In this lecture, we look at an application of the orbit stabilizer theorem and calculate or figure out what is the group of symmetries of the unit cube or a cube in three dimensions. So let us recall what is the orbit stabilizer theorem. Suppose we have an action of a group G on a set X and X is an arbitrary element in capital X, then we have that the index of the stabilizer of X is same as the cardinality of the orbit of X. So let us recall what is stabilizer of X. This is equal to those group elements which stabilize X. And we notice that this is a subgroup of G, so one can talk about its, uh, its index. And the orbit stabilizer theorem is saying that this index is same as this cardinality. In case uh, G and X are finite, we get the expression that the cardinality of G is equal to the cardinality of the orbit of X times the cardinality of the stabilizer of X. All right, this is when X and G are finite. Okay, another thing that we need to know about is special orthogonal group. So this is a linear algebraic concept. Suppose we have a linear map from Rn to Rn. We say that T is an isometry if certain thing happens. So I will explain that. An isometry is defined as any linear map which satisfies this equation. And what is what is this, these angular brackets? So this is uh, the standard inner product. So x dot y or this angular bracket x comma y denotes this sum. This is the standard inner product or also known as the dot product on Rn. So what this says is that t preserves distances and angles. Basically that is the idea which leads to this definition. And the terminology is well chosen. Iso means same and metry means metric or geometry. So Isometries are geometry preserving transformations, geometry preserving linear transformations of Rn. Alright, so what is this guy? This guy is defined as those linear maps or you could say invertible linear maps, but that's redundant. You would just say linear maps such that this happens. So what is T star? T star is the adjoint of T with respect to the standard inner product. So saying that T is an isometry is same as saying that uh, T star equals uh, T star T equals I. So let me record that. T is an isometry. if and only if t star t is the identity linear map uh, where t star is the adjoint of t with respect to the standard inner product all right so sonr is those isometries whose determinant is one the geometric meaning of this is that t preserves orientation but don't worry about that so this is a group and it is in fact a subgroup of glnr all right so this is a small reco uh, recollection from linear algebra and here is a very nice uh, theorem from linear algebra that every element of SO3R is rotation by an axis. This is called Euler's theorem. And let me explain what this means. So we have our R3. And suppose T is in SO3. Then the theorem says that there is an axis. There is some axis uh, which I have drawn in orange. And some angle theta such that if you rotate the entire space about this axis by the angle theta, then that uh, transformation of the, of the space, which is of course linear, agrees with T, meaning it is equal to T. So every, every element of SO3R is actually a rotation, and that is, that is what SONR is supposed to capture. SONR is supposed to capture the quote-unquote rotations of Rn, and here we can show it explicitly that indeed it is rotations. So this is a, this is a fact from linear algebra, and I'll use it. All right, so... Here is our cube. So we define the cube as this set, and more explicitly, it is those points in R3, uh, such that each of the coordinates is either plus one or minus one. So there are eight things here, eight vectors, if you will. Okay, and it looks something like that, and uh, the coordinate axis would look something like this. These are the coordinate axis, and the cube is that guy. All right. So, for the moment, let me delete that. Okay. So what is G? G is, G is our group, which is those things in SO3 such that TV belongs to C for all V belongs to C. So those rotations of the entire three-dimensional space, which take every vector in C to a vector in C. So it's, it's basically rotations of the cube. That is what, what this is. So this is supposed to capture rotations of the cube.
right? Okay, and now one can see that G is finite simply because, first of all, if you have a linear map there, uh, and, and you know what it does to the vectors in C, then you know what it does to any other vector. It's basically, the linear map is decided by its behavior on the vectors in C simply because the vectors in C span the entire three-dimensional space. All right, so a very bad upper bound on the size of G is the cardinality of this which is equal to 8 to the power 8, which is a huge number, it is 2 to the power 24, I think. Yeah. So this is certainly uh, an upper bound for uh, the cardinality of G. But we can do much better, is what I'm trying to say. So first we will define, there's a natural action of G on C. So G acts on C how? Uh, define this map, phi G cross C to C, which takes G comma V, let me write, Mm, maybe w is equal to g of w all right sorry this is phi of g of w g comma w is equal to g of w so g is a linear map and w is a vector in c so this is just the evaluation or the image of the vector w under the linear map g and this is how we define uh, the map phi and one can check that this is an action check that this is an action All right, that's easy. So another thing is uh, that this action is transitive. This action is transitive. What is a transitive action? A transitive action is an action such that it has only one orbit. Meaning you pick a pick a point in the set and consider consider its orbit, then its orbit is the entire set. So to see that, uh, suppose I have this vector v here, this one, which is one comma one comma one. What is the orbit of this guy? So if we rotate about this vertical axis, which is passing through the midpoint of these two faces and of course passing through the origin, if you rotate 90 degrees about this axis, this point goes here, another 90 degree rotation makes it uh, puts it here, another 90 puts it here and then back. So the orbit of V certainly contains all these points. If we rotate about this axis, then it comes here uh, and then here and then here. So we see that the orbit of V contains all these points. How do, how do we get here? Well. First we get here by the rotation about this, this axis and then to get from here to there we rotate about this axis and then again rotate and then again rotate. So the orbit of V con consists of all the eight points and therefore the action is transitive. So that's easy. And uh, finally, what is the stabilizer of V? This we claim is equal to 3. Why is that? Because suppose I have a I have an element of G which stabilizes V. So it is a rotation of the entire three-dimensional space which stabilizes this vector and uh, hence it has to be a rotation about this axis. Basically it has to be a rotation about uh, the axis passing through the origin and V. Why is that? So first of all, it, if you have a rotation, it has to be rotation about some axis. That is Euler's theorem. That is what we recalled in the beginning. So it is clearly fixing all the points here, right? And if it is rotation about some other axis, some, some other axis, then it will be fixing this entire plane because it is fixing all the points here and all the points there and, and hence it will be fixing th this entire two dimensional plane. And now if you use the fact that the determinant of uh, the, the map T is, uh, is equal to one, you will see that actually the map is identity. So, so identity is also a rotation about this axis by zero degrees. So therefore, if you have uh, a linear map or, or, or an element of G which fixes, which fixes the vector V, then it has to be rotation about this axis, passing through V and the opposite of V. All right, so let me draw that just for reference. All right. Right. Okay, so now if we have a rotation of the cube, meaning an element of here which, which fixes that, it, it is rotation by some angle, whatever that angle is, we will we'll talk about that. So this is some angle theta. Now it has to take elements of the cube to the elements of the cube. So this guy has to go somewhere, some, you know, under, under, under this rotation, this vector or this point has to go somewhere in the cube. Where can it possibly go? If you just think about it, it has to go to a point which is at the same distance from V 
as it is now. So right now, whatever is this distance is actually 2 because the way we define the cube, this distance is 2. I think so, yeah. So the image of this point under the notation also has to be distance 2 and the only points in the cube which are at distance 2 from the vertex V are this point, that point and that point. So basically, this rotation then has to take this to either that point or to that point or it has to fix it in case the rotation is identity rotation, then of course it will fix it. So if you just think about it, you will see that the rotation by 120 degrees takes this point there and rotation by 240, sorry, yeah, 240 degrees takes uh, takes this point to that point. So the uh, stabilizer of, of, this, of this vector is three rotations. One is the identity rotation, the other is the rotation by 120 degrees and the other is the rotation by 240 degrees and that's it. Therefore the stabilizer has size 3. And now by this orbit stabilizer theorem, the size of g is orbit of, size of orbit of v times size of stabilizer of v, which says this is equal to 3 times, um, sorry, 8 times 3, which is 24. So this is a much better, you know, we, we know the exact exact magnitude of g. This is not some bound and certainly not a horrible bound. So we know the size of g is 24. But we can say much more. We can actually find out what this group is. So to do that, let d be the four diagonals. These four diagonals are drawn in yellow. So you take a vertex and join it with the opposite vertex, which is a diagonal. And since there are a total of eight vertices, you get four diagonals and they are listed here. The vertices are marked a, a prime, d, t prime and so on. So these are the four diagonals. And we'll define an action of g on this diagonal. So define, maybe I'll write it as psi. So psi is a map from g cross t to d. And psi of, let me just write, uh, you know, g is equal to, g comma that is equal to g of a, comma g of a prime and so on. So I've said what uh, what happens for this particular guy, but you can guess what happens for every other. It's the same same kind of same kind of definition. And one can check that this is an action. So that I leave to you. Check that this is an action. The slightly less trivial part of this checking is is that this is indeed a diagonal, right? This is a diagonal. How do we know that this is a diagonal? Well, again, g is an isometry, so whatever is the distance between a and a prime, same is the distance between g a and g a prime. Therefore, since the diagonal has the greatest length amongst all the pairs of points on the cube, we see that uh, this has to be a diagonal because the distance between these two is the distance between these two. Therefore, the distance between these two is the maximum possible, and the maximum pos possible distance appears only when you have the diagonal. Therefore, this is a diagonal, and this is an action, you know, the two properties you can easily check. Okay, so since we have an action, we get a map from G to the symmetry group of the diagonals. We have this homomorphism, call it uh, little psi maybe, small psi, this is capital psi. So if we can show that this is a surjective homomorphism, then we are done, because the size of this is 24 and the size of that is 24. So to do that, we will show that every transposition, the every transposition in here is in the image of psi. And since transpositions generate the entire symmetry group, as we saw earlier, we, we, will, we will have shown that this is surjective and hence bijective because the sizes are same. And therefore, this would be a bijective uh, group homomorphism and hence an isomorphism. So how do we show that every transposition appears here? We will not do a formal proof, but I will indicate that uh, via this diagram. So consider the midpoint of A prime B prime and the midpoint of AB. This is capital A and that is capital A prime. Consider this particular axis, this particular line, and consider the rotation by 180 degrees about this line. Okay. What does this rotation do to the diagonals? This particular diagonal, I claim, becomes that diagonal. Why is that? Because 180 degree rotation takes B prime to A prime and B to A. And therefore, this, this diagonal indeed becomes that diagonal. All right. What about the other two diagonals? Well, this axis, takes this point, meaning the point C prime, to C because it's a 180 degree rotation. And you can prove this formally, but if you visualize a little bit, you'll see that this is perpendicular to the plane of the diagonals C, C prime and D, D prime. And 180 degree rotation will take C prime to C. Similarly, it will take D to D prime and D prime to D. So basically it is, it is you know, at the level of vertices, it is doing something non-trivial, but this diagonal is going back to itself and this diagonal is going back to itself. 
So the other two diagonals are fixed under rotation by 180 degree about this axis. And hence it is a transposition. It is the transposition which switches this diagonal with that diagonal. And similarly you can show that any two diagonals can be switched via suitable rotation. And therefore every transposition appears as the image of some member of G. And uh, that's it. That's the proof. Right? Um, so very nice. We have the symmetric group. Oh, sorry, the group of rotations of the cube is the symmetric group on four letters. That's very nice. And this shows uh, an application of the orbit stabilizer theorem. Alright, so with this I want to end this lecture. As usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.